everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, sorry for a couple of minutes delay there. I hope all your journeys were okay and stress-free getting here. Uh, my name is Catherine Mackridge. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar um, from Resilience to Resistance, uh, Organising for Better Mental Health and Wellbeing at Work as part of the TUC's Organise 2020 Festival. Um, I'm really excited to be able to introduce to you four brilliant speakers. Um, who are all coming uh, to this topic um, from different angles uh, and to hopefully have time within that hour for um, a good discussion with some, some Q&As as well. Um, so I'll introduce the speakers properly in a few moments. Um, but the first thing to say, uh, I think that's important, is that we are not able to cover everything to do with mental health and wellbeing, work and organising in the uh, 56 minutes that we have remaining. It is an absolutely huge topic, it covers so many areas. Um, so I hope people can engage with this um, seminar and see it as a longer conversation in the trade union movement and beyond about the different um, areas of this issue. Uh, secondly, uh, mental health is a very sensitive topic and I do want everyone here to feel included and comfortable. The TUC's Organised 2020 Festival does have a code of conduct. Um, hopefully my colleague will be able to share that on the screen, but if not, I will just um, read it out uh, for everyone so they are aware. So the TUC is committed to organising activities at which everyone can participate in an inclusive, respectful and safe environment. The TUC has zero tolerance for any type of harassment, including sexual harassment, aggressive, offensive, intimidatory, dis disrespectful, unacceptable behaviour or comments will not be tolerated and we can kick you off the seminar. And this supports the commitment set out in the TUC's rules to promote equality for all and to eliminate all forms of harassment, including sexual harassment, prejudice and unfair discrimination. And this policy applies to all aspects of communication at or in connection with an event, including postings on social media. If you have any concerns that you want to raise, then please email us events1, so the number one, at tuc.org.uk. Uh, so I just wanted that to be said and um, given uh, the TUC's uh, commitment to that and the, the topic that we'll be discussing. Uh, so just very quickly, um, I'm going to be your chair um, for the session. My name is Catherine. I work at the TUC. I'll introduce the speakers shortly, but just kind of scene setting a little bit. Um, and that's that we spend a very significant time amount of time uh, in our adult life at work and supporting good mental health and well-being at work is increasingly being seen um, by employers as important um, but there's still way too many that don't even consider it a priority or, or get it wrong entirely. Of course as trade unionists we believe in collectivism an injury to one is an injury to all and so while mental health can impact on everyone in very different ways it can affect us all. The workplace improvements we negotiate to support worker, workers are in everyone's interest um, and it, as, as is including uh, supporting our disabled comrades in work. So trade unions should be very wary of the kind of uh, prevalence of these well-being initiatives, this resilience training and anything that uh, claims to be able to fix a problem um, rather than tackling the root cause. I'm thinking the awareness posters, the encouragement to take a break and do mindfulness, eating fruit and veg, um, petting puppies. These are not inherently bad things in themselves. Um, everyone loves some free fruit and free snacks, but these are not the answer. And trade unions must resist the idea of mental health and wellness being corporatized and question this encroachment on the resilience industry. Because all that does, it moves the responsibility away from the employer it assumes that people's experience of stress or mental ill health is entirely separate from the workplace, when in fact it is the workplace or work itself that could be contributing to it or exacerbating it. It assumes that mental health is something to fix, that it's something that can be easily done on an individual level and places the responsibility to do so with the worker. And it assumes a trust in an employer so, as I said, raising awareness about mental health and well-being, talking about it um, can be good for a lot of people, but being expected to disclose this to a potentially hostile employer opens us up to discrimination. 
Uh, and fundamentally, these initiatives do not encourage employers to invest the time, the effort and the resources to ensure fair workplace policies and proper support for staff. For example, giving out free fruit is a lot cheaper than giving everyone a pay rise. So we, I kind of wanted to set that scene at the beginning, um, just to sort of firmly place uh, ourselves in that area of collective um, responses to collective issues. And a lot of our speakers will be talking about this in a bit more detail from different angles. And we've got to remember, we have seen huge improvements in health, safety and well-being law uh, at work, like down to the campaigning by trade unions. But this progress does not always manifest. I mean, the headline figure from ACAS poll last year was that two thirds of employees have felt stressed and or anxious about work in that past 12 months. And that's just employees, so that's not even capturing the experiences of workers and those on more insecure contracts. And lastly, you know, that was the case before COVID hit. And we all know the long list that seems overwhelming about the problems down the line. We've got the isolation from friends and family, grieving for loved ones, increase in domestic abuse, worries about jobs and finances in the future, and the devastating impact on BME workers and their communities in particular. So that was not a very positive start, but I can assure you that we are going to be talking much more positively about the solutions to tackle this collectively uh, through our speakers um, in the next uh, 45 minutes. So first of all, I would uh, just do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I mean, you've all been uh, attending these webinars over the last couple of months, so you know the drill. We're gonna, I'm gonna introduce the speakers one by one. They're gonna have uh, up to seven minutes uh, to speak. That will give us time to allow for questions and you can pose them to any of the speakers. Um, if you could post your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom, not the chat, that just helps me and my colleague doing the tech kind of working out where everyone is, is uh, where the questions are being posted. Um, this session is being filmed, um, but if your cameras are off, then that shouldn't be uh, an issue. And the hashtag that we're asking people to follow is hashtag organize 2020. So even if your question um, doesn't get raised here to the, to the panelists, we really encourage you to continue this conversation and, and uh, welcome your reflections on this issue um, under that hashtag. And at the end of the session, there'll be a couple of links um, for sort of further resources um, to find out a little bit more. So it gives me great pleasure um, to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sonia Adesara. She's an NHS doctor. Um, she was the National Medical Director's Clinical Fellow between 2018 and 19. She is a council member for the Socialist Health Association, Doctors in Unite member, and a former co-chair of the Young Medical Women International Association. Thank you for being with us, Sonia, and over to you. Thanks for having me. Can everyone see and hear me? Yeah, okay. So I'm just going to, um, so thanks for having me. So I thought I would just give a bit of a, um, my insight into the current state of mental health services um, in this country and then um, a bit of my thoughts about where we go next. Um, so I first, um, my first experience of mental health services was when I was junior doctor and um, working in the south of England. This was about 2015 when we were, I guess, starting to really see the impact of cuts and austerity on the services. Um, and it was, I think, a real turning point for me, which made me become a um, health activist um, because I was just so up upset and angry at what I saw. Um, so in the hospital I was working in, we were constantly running out of beds. We were routinely discharging vulnerable people into B&Bs to try and free up space. And um, we didn't have enough nurses, we didn't have enough therapists. Um, and I just, I saw, things that happened that should have never happened. Um, so I remember we had a, um, a young woman sexually assaulted on the ward. Um, the man that assaulted her was someone with a known sexual history. He should have never been admitted to, into a mixed ward in the first place. She herself was very unwell, very vulnerable. She should have been monitored properly. Um, and this is something that I just frequently saw on the ward. Um, neglect and failings of care. Um, due to the fact that our service was just so overstretched, so under strain, um, and we were just not able to cope. And then I guess fast forward a few years, I've done a few different jobs in the meantime, and then this year I started a mental health job in London. Um, and 
I was hoping things were better, but um, to be honest, I think things have got worse in our mental health services. Um, so the staff situation has got worse. We have lost, um, we're down by 15% of nurses in the past decade. The bed situation has got worse. Um, we are down by 32% of mental health NHS beds. Um, and in the, in, the, in the area that I work, in the trust that we work, we are constantly in a situation where we have no beds. And I remember in our, my induction on the first day, I was told by management that at, at that current day, we had 70 people from our area in private hospitals. So the trust was paying for them to be put into private hospitals because we had no beds. Um, and I was told that we had children from our area who were in hospital beds across the country and as far away as Yorkshire um, because there were just no beds in where I was working in, in North London. Um, and we're also seeing the impact of privatization on our mental health services. So you know, in my area, the drug and alcohol services have been privatized. Um, and like what always happens when the private sector takes over healthcare, they try and cut corners, cut staff, try and limit the service as much as possible, try and buy the bare minimum um, to try and, I guess, make as much profit as possible from healthcare. Um, and you know, something that I actually saw quite a lot when I was working in A&E is that for many people coming in um, with the most serious mental health problems, they also were really suffering from drug and alcohol addiction. Um, and we just, they were coming in week after week, um, needing care, wanting care and help with their addiction, but there was just no service for them, for us to refer them to. Um, and it was just awful because I think I did this job for six, that job for six months and I saw people from the start of my job to the end, the same people coming in week on week on week and I saw their physical and their mental health just deteriorate um, in front of my eyes um, and just being completely helpless about it. Um, and again, the statistics reflect that. So we've seen in the past few years, year on year, deaths from drug and alcohol addiction increasing in this country. Um, and I guess this is just what makes me so angry because I, 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 we have all heard now for years and years this, this line of you know, parity of steam, steam between mental health and physical health. But it's just an, it's absolute nonsense because you know, we would never in physical health accept a situation where a third of children who need mental, mental health care are not getting the care that they need. You would never <laughs> accept a situation in physical health where people are getting admitted to hospital beds on the other side of the country. Um, and if we really did have equality, then we wouldn't have the situation where people with serious mental health issues are dying 15 to 20 years earlier than the rest of the population. Um, and then I also wanna talk about, um, because when I see people in, in the mental health hospital um, or in a &E, it's often when they are most unwell um, and actually often they've been failed by the system. But when I was working in general practice, um, I saw people who were, um, I guess, coming to see me when they were first starting to struggle with their mental health. And I think something that I'd say for the majority of people, um, and when I say majority, I think like maybe over 90% of people who are coming to see me, you can always identify and they could identify or it was quite often you could see that there was something in their life um, like an, a stress in their environment that was that had triggered them to become unwell and struggle with their mental health and um, something that's you know one of something that's quite common I think over the past few years I've noticed is people having issues with their housing and that was affecting their mental health so housing conditions and um, lack of security of housing being moved you know moved by the council to an area away from their family so housing issues was a factor that was quite increasingly common around, around people coming in with mental health issues. Um, I think the most, you know, by far the most common factor was issues around um, finances or work and that, or actually those two things, you know, were interlinked for many people. Um, so many, many people, um, a, a trigger and a stress for them for their, for their mental health was just not being able to make ends meet, um, struggling with their finances, struggling to pay bills. Um, and we know that 45% of people um, who are in debt have a diagnosed mental, mental illness. Um, another thing that we see really commonly is people that just struggle to get the welfare support that they need. Um, and you know, we have a welfare system that is deliberately, um, deliberately obstructive, like deliberately difficult. And you know, in the mental health clinic that I was working in, we've actually had to hire, um, hire staff to help people access the benefit system because it's so difficult just for everyone but never mind if you have something with your mental health um, and then work is a really really common um really common factor that that was that was causing people to have issues and stress and um, related 
causing ill health. So I'm talking about workplace stress and bullying in the workplace, really common. And um, also just a feeling of, of worthlessness in the workplace, not being valued, feeling like you know a cog in the wheel, not being respected as a person, um, lack, lack of autonomy, um, lack of um, work security. Again, it's something really common, lack of having you know, just basic workers' rights, things like sick pay. Um, and then just, uh, this is something that I think has really shown up in the past couple of months with COVID. So we've seen that um, in certain occupations, so social care, um, cleaners, our porters, they are, if you look at the numbers dying, it's significantly higher than the rest of the population. And it's been identified that that just that lack of basic um, workers' rights and, and, and things like sick pay, so they can't isolate, has been identified in the factor of why we're seeing numbers dying. I and mean, these issues have been something that people with mental health issues have been suffering for for years. Um, and it's, you know, it's Sonia, really I'm sorry to have to uh, cut you off there. Sorry, um, just because we are really, really tight for time and we have got um, a lot of speakers that um, that we need to, to hear from. Um, but there'll be a chance to sort of come back to some of these issues um, in the Q&A because what you're raising is absolutely what the seminar um, is about. So we're going to hear from um, Kendall next, who will be able to pick up um, what you're talking about, about work workplace issues. And then we can kind of all come back together at the end with the participants on that. Um, if that's okay, I'm really sorry, but that is my role. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Um, I want to introduce now um, Kendall Bromley Buse. She is a children's nurse working in Bristol. Um, she sits on Unison's National Executive Committee and is the Vice Chair for TUC Young Workers Forum. Uh, thank you, Kendall, and welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, so yeah, <coughs> apologies. Um, so yeah, so my name's Kendall, um, I'm a children's nurse and all of those things that Catherine's just said. Um, so I'm kind of going to talk about mental health in young people. So why is it important? Um, as we know, it's kind of a known fact that young people are suffering with their mental health. Um, but why they're suffering with their mental health is kind of one of those issues that's very presumed and it's very um, spoken about and oh yes well they're young they're suffering oh, the internet kind of thing um, so it's not you know the internet it's there's so many different reasons that young people are suffering with their mental health um, and workplace issues um, like someone said is a massive reason um, that we're getting these things so mental health isn't just you know it's not mental and physical health it is an integral part of your health so during COVID um, and isolation particularly, um, we've had massive increases um, in concerns for mental health um, for young people and whether you call that young people under 27, under 30, um, it kind of depends on who, on who that is, uh, but there are lots of um, mental health concerns. So this could be about um, your workplace rights, um, this could be about or it could be it could be family stresses. It could be you haven't got enough um, money to feed the family. Um, you haven't applied for furlough. All these things that kind of are a massive input on um, on health. So like um, like Catherine said, I work in a hospital and I work in the children's hospital. Um, and during COVID, we've seen a massive increase of um, overdoses and suicidal attempts, um, kind of just within this time in children under 16, which is really concerning. Um, we've, all, we've also seen quite a lot of abandoned children at the hospital, um, where parents were really stressed and weren't able to kind of um, look after their children. So even though, you know, these children aren't in, you know, they're not young workers yet and already they are massively affected um, by these workplace rights and by the fact that their parents are unable to <clears throat> support them properly with you know low pay extra stress management all these kind of things so the TUC Young Workers Forum we do some absolutely incredible work and we're currently looking at mental health um, and we're kind of looking at three main areas so we're looking at the labour market we're looking at bad employees and public service austerity so when you look at the labour market um, young people are very much more likely to be in low paying jobs, minimum wage, um, you know, if you look at the minimum wage, it, there's nothing like legal age discrimination, the minimum wage is, it's, you know, classic, um, which is incredibly stressful for young people, you do the same work at 17 that you do at 25, you know, if you're in that same role, there is no difference. We are much more likely to be in insecure work, um, which can be incredibly tricky um, to kind of make sure you're, you know, you're able to plod and you're able to just live your life normally, you know, not even have any kind of nice holidays or any of those things, just be able to live and pay your rent just day by day. You need to have secure work, which often young people don't have. 
Um, and because of this zero hours contracts and a lot of agency work that young people kind of have to do to just get along in the world, um, we tend to miss out a lot on work like basic workplace rights. So kind of statutory sick pay, um, time off. And there's a lot of bullying and harassment that goes on within these workplaces. I've seen time and time again, and I've heard time and time again from my members that um, you know, we get these situations where people, if they don't take up the extra shifts, um, then they don't get offered them anymore. So if you don't come in six days in a row, you don't get offered them. And if you're in school, or if you're in college, or if you're in university, you know, I've, I've known lots of my peers skip college and university just so they can keep going because they know that otherwise there won't be, there won't be any money coming in. So bad, em bad employers. You know, we look at cultural, cultural workplace practices. Um, I've worked in many different places and not all of them are great. And culturally, you know, the workplace has been, it's a fascinating place, isn't it, workplaces? And if you're in a place where, for example, I used to work in a swimming pool um, and it always used to be the situation where somebody would get pushed in the pool. Just one of the workers, one of the lifeguards would get pushed in all the time. He could have his phone in his pocket and he'd have to get a new phone every day like every week every two weeks um, and that was just normal and everyone just kind of assumed that was normal because the managers did it um, you know and that is something that was horrific for his mental health it was horrific for new people coming in because they didn't know if that was going to be them in a few weeks so it's all of these situations that you know cultural norms in the workplace just don't work it just doesn't it doesn't affect it we need to change these things that are happening kind of day to day in our workplaces it could be as obvious as pushing somebody in the pool or it could be small you know eat away comments every day uh, then we look at public service austerity so as we know there's been massive uh, reductions in funding for loads of mental health services um, we you know there's so much longer waiting times and you always hear this that uh, the phrase that young people use a lot is you aren't crazy enough yet uh, if you want to access uh, mental health services you just aren't crazy enough yet so it's all of these things that, you know, you could go along to mental health service and you need mental, mental health intervention and you've been able to go and identify that, which is absolutely incredible. And then they'll say, you know, our waiting lists are massive and you could be waiting 18 months um, for the help that you need now. Um, you know, they say you, are, you aren't crazy enough now, so you have to wait, um, you know, wait until you're at a real breaking point, which is horrific. And you see it time and time again. So we get loads of children coming to our hospital at a point where actually they really needed to be seen before and where they, they showed up before, you know, they presented. Um, but the services are so cut down that they just don't have the space for that. So we kind of experiences in organising for better mental health in the workplace. Um, and although, like Catherine said, yoga and mindfulness is is lovely it's very much like just putting a plaster on an open wound it does it does nothing for you know the core issue of uh, mental health problems within the workplace um, so we need to evaluate what it is at, at work that actually causes these stress is it the low pay is it hours that don't work is it do you actually get breaks do you actually you know all these things just don't you know people just don't kind of look at and they just presume it's oh people aren't doing enough yoga um, so we've got to really look into, you know, are the fundamental basic, you know, rights of people being looked after at work. Um, so we've got a tool uh, as a TUC and workers one, which is absolutely amazing. It's called From Resilience to Resistance. Um, and it's a really great place to start. Uh, I think it will be shared with you. Um, yeah, I'm getting a nod. <laughs> it'll be shared with you. Um, it's a really great tool to kind of have a look at. Um, it kind of looks at the three issues that I've spoken about and it talks about, um, goes into a bit more detail and talks about how actually you can organise in the workplace around mental health and around, um, you know, not just yoga days and posters that say, drink a glass of water, you'll feel better. It's actually like, these are the core things that will help you. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Kendall. Um, that was uh, very much um, chiming with what Sonia was saying around uh, and, and you know what the trade union is concerned about around um, austerity and the impact on support services and that access and how we've got into a strange yeah. situation where we're not actually tackling it early on and we're waiting for it to, to become a crisis yeah. before the intervention is there um, but also around some of the uh, 
things that we'd like trade unions to focus on, like where, where we can make a, a difference immediately, uh, which is in the workplace. Um, I'd like to introduce um, our third speaker now, who's Anne Galpin. Um, Anne is an autistic journalist living with mental distress and invisible impairments. She is a survivor of violence, workplace bullying and discrimination. She's a team worker and connecting and developing disabled activists across the labour movement. I'm really excited to have her here. She's also the co-chair of the TUC Disabled Workers Committee since 2018 and has been active on it since 2010. And last year she co-chaired the TUC's National Disabled Workers Conference last year. I'm not done. She's the chair of the NUJ's Disabled Members Council since 2008, campaigning on workplace mental health barriers facing disabled journalists and ethical journalism, calling for fair and accurate reporting on disabled people in austerity policies and was the equality officer in the Cambridge and District Trades Councils from 2013 to 2018. And Anne is going to um, give us intervention on, on some of her perspective on the, I guess, the conversation around mental health and well-being at work and some of the great work that she has done in this field. Thank you, Anne. Um, hello, everyone. Um, just straight off, I'm a very nervous speaker because um, that's part of my impairment, but I, um, so I hope I'll calm down and, and deliver you something of interest, but I'm always open to trade unionists who want to discuss these matters further. Um, I'd like to start with saying that um, mental distress is often a perfectly normal response to stress and trauma. Um, it's our brain doing what it's meant to do. It's sort of flagging up that we're in situations that are dangerous that we need to get out of. Um, on the subject of workplace uh, stress, um, the resilience model of mental health is too often used to place the blame flat on the individual so that the workplace, was, the workplace stress becomes, sorry, not the employer's fault for an inflicting unreasonable working conditions, but the workers' fault for failing to practice mindfulness exercise, adopt a better work-life balance. We'll start, we're all saying some fairly similar messages here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, people's mental health benefits when they engage with others in collective activity that seeks to reassert control over their own lives, hence the importance of being part of an active union. Um, when I became, at, um, as with quite a few trade union activists, my own activism began when I was in a very uncomfortable workplace situation. And at that stage, I was so deeply self-stigmatized. I had taken on all the lessons about weakness and that I didn't, yeah, I internalized and got myself very ill. And I was lucky that in a chance branch meeting, I just, the right person said the right thing at the right time and that enabled me to see that what was happening was workplace bullying was not a fair situation to be in and to reach out to my trade union which is national union of journalists and although i was quite ill at the time they did support me towards um some form of resolution which Obviously, like many resolutions, a non-disclosure agreement. Um, but, but the fact that I think it's at once a good thing that the trade union try we try as hard as possible to catch those members who reach similar situations. But it's also a sad situation that for many of us we're not active before we we encounter difficulty. So I, I just think it benefits all of us as a collective voice. Um, I've um, already in what Sonia was saying and what Kendall was saying, there's so many sort of commonalities here. Um, uh, with Sonia, I, I completely agree that the, 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 the drug and alcohol addiction is sort of dual diagnosis going hand in hand as, but as really a reflection of mental distress and trauma. But that in itself is, can be a source of stigma and shame. If, if, a, if a worker is self-medicating to try and get through the day, it's very difficult to open up to a line manager that this is an issue, a live issue for you, 
without them, without the fear of repercussions, negative repercussions. Um, it's very difficult to get to seek the right interventions that can help one overcome this, the, um, the addiction because you can't really overcome the addiction um, until you've reached a better, uh, you've done quite a lot of work with your mental distress or, and that's not trying to put the blame back on the individual who's experienced that. I'm speaking as somebody who has come through addiction, which was a self-medicating response to trauma, but in the process of coming through it, um, my health has improved radically. So they go like that, both up together. So I, I would really urge anybody who has, is finding that their reliance, more increasingly reliance on some form of substance to, to support you through, do reach out and do seek help because it, it can only get better once you start to work again, you know, once you get support. The trouble is, as already highlighted, that to find the right sort of support when you're ill is really difficult because you're in this downward spiral. Um, so depending on what form of mental distress, how you're, depending on the form your mental distress takes, you may be rendered almost inarticulate, catatonic. You may, you may come across garbled and in, inarticulate. Um, so it's difficult to access the support and it's very easy to be submissed, dismissed, forgotten. For reps out there who um, I know in our own union that a, um, an increasing high caseload of our, of our um, individual caseload our members in mental distress and this was pre-COVID um, we were already dealing with a high caseload of workers in distress and obviously during COVID with um, the additional worries, pressures and um, precarity this is the numbers are rising. Um, if we could really embrace and work with the social model of disability so that, and the social model of mental distress. We wouldn't be placing the blame on the individual. We wouldn't be seeking sticking plaster approaches to, to supporting people. Um, people, many more of us, disabled or non-disabled, would be able to work productively and fruitfully if we were given the right level of support. So actually it's a no brainer for employees. I don't, employers and, and the economy. I don't know why more people don't understand that um, supporting people through mental distress is is essential. It's humanity. It's. Um, I'd like to flag up briefly. Um, touched on by we're well, not in this seminar, but Sonia in a very brilliant keep our NHS public and health unions together. I think it was you, Sonia, who spoke on it in the health inequalities um, in COVID. Well, it was definitely, it was organized by the health unions together and, and um, keep our NHS public. But um, the fact that distributions of distress is highly structured. I mean, rates of distress are definitely higher amongst working class communities, people of color, um, particularly black people disabled people, um, LGBT plus Q people, um, in particular trans people. The, the stresses, the intersectional areas are where, and young members, sorry, Kendall, not leaving, <laughs> and on, on young members definitely within our movement. So the more intersectional working we can do, the more coming together we can do, um, I think we'll, be, we'll find power through that. Um, during COVID, I'd just like to say a word for um, other people already living with mental distress. Um, you may have found that your ability to access your support networks, treatment, and your usual means of managing your mental health have, have diminished. I mean, I was on a, I'm in a nine year waiting list, or approximately nine year waiting list for um, support for complex PTSD. Uh, a two-year 
waiting lists for um, support with very late diagnosis, aid, attention deficit and autistic spectrum conditions. And for both those conditions, I received letters a month into to COVID, to the lockdown, saying that all the services were sort of truncated and stopped because obviously we've got a national pandemic and people are furloughed. And But for the person who, I might have been holding on to that two year thing as a lifeline. I, I've been let down before, so, uh, and many of us have. So I found other ways to support myself, but if, if that had been the lifeline, I've only got to wait two years till I see somebody who will understand my cognitive processing difference, why I get distressed by something that other people find easy. Um, that in itself would be a trigger to further stress. Yes. So you're round in a circle. Um, yes. And it's, it's crucial that employers and, the, and unions take these issues seriously and take proactive measures to support and protect health and safety of workers, whether we're re working remotely or in the workplace. Yeah. For freelance Thank workers. Oh, uh, Anne, sorry. I'm going to have to, um, just because we're really yeah, running out of time. No, it's okay. There's so much to say on this topic. So, um, I have a small thing that Quinn, my, um, our wonderful... Do you mind if we do it at the end of the session, Anne? I will definitely bring you in on it, definitely. I just want to make sure Adam gets his time and some questions as well. But I just... No, it's no problem whatsoever. Like I said at the beginning, there's so much to cover in this. Um, but just like, thank you so much for 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 your intervention on that, particularly sharing um, with us, you know, what that experiences have been like, you know, um, both in work and outside of work. Uh, we've had a couple of comments popping up already. I can see saying they weren't aware of the social model, not thought of applying it before. So that was really helpful that that you brought that to the session, and we can make sure that. Uh, colleagues in the in the webinar will get more information about that um, okay so now I'm going to introduce our final speaker um, Adam Willis uh, he's uh, worked uh, at the land registry in Nottingham office for 32 years and following a number of years of local union roles he was elected to the land registry GEC 12 years ago and has been group assistant secretary for six years he is also the secretary of the departmental health and safety committee a secretary of the uh, Secretary of the Departmental Equal, Equal Opportunities Committee and is one of the lead negotiators for HR policy and I forgot to say the very important thing right at the beginning of that which is that he's from PCS so thank you Adam and thank you for joining us. Thank you can you hear me now? Yep okay so thanks for that. So to give a bit of background first, over a number of years, uh, departmental trade union side and, and land registry HR have discussed mental health in the workplace through the departmental health and safety committee, but we never really got anywhere. Partly down to a lack of knowledge, but more down to a lack of willingness to not work together. And that came from both sides. Got examples of correspondence that are dozens of pages long, but never actually achieved anything or no it was really given from either side to to get anywhere. So following elections one year I was elected to the Health and Safety Committee and the group executive appointed me as secretary together with a new chair and assistant secretary and that was our introduction to the Health and Safety Committee of which we hadn't been part of previously. Organising was an issue as the committee only met actually met three times a year and did everything else through correspondence and that included a meeting with the official side so things were allowed to build up over months between meetings without getting resolved and we honestly felt that we simply weren't representing the members well enough. Things were so bad that the health and safety manager actually sat about 20 feet away from me, but was still emailing me rather than talking to me. But then again, I was also emailing him back. So one day I wandered over to his desk and asked him for a chat and we had a frank and open discussion about how we were doing things. And that both of us at the time were working really hard to represent thousands of people that actually weren't really doing it very well. So one of the first things we did was to start arranging weekly catch-ups with each other to build up a decent working relationship. We also approached the lead health and safety and facilities managers to discuss how we can get things running better between us all and agreed that the chair and secretary would meet with the health and safety manager and their colleagues more regularly in order that we could discuss matters between the official Whitley meetings rather than let them build up and we end up having whole day meetings three times a year. 
unfortunately that has carried on there are different people running health and safety now but that relationship is now excellent we sit down together all the time discuss everything health and safety and we discuss policy before it is written and are usually involved at all levels of discussions rather than consultation it does actually feel like we're working together on health and safety while still retaining the independent representation for members so historically it felt like mental health in the workplace was one of the soft issues and again it felt like the departmental trade union also saw it like that mental health in the workplace was also solely left to the health and safety committees to deal with so following a second successful pcs campaign against privatization in 2016 it was confirmed that land registry would remain in the public sector to assist the government with its housing strategy and land registries put in a business strategy to assist with this work and to modernize the organization now any such changes are going to be a massive worry for members and reps alike therefore the business strategy is underpinned by a formal agreement that was negotiated by us on the strength of our campaign success and the fact that our group had a high membership density so this agreement guarantees proper consultation on any proposed changes that may affect members and most importantly provides assurances around jobs offices digital changes and operational issues we also signed joint working practices agreements have since agreed to the data principles policy which does which does not allow the interrogation of data down to a personal level only looking at data as a team or office as a whole and recognizing that an individual will not produce the same amount of work each day due to the complexity of what we do and it's i'm happy to say that we currently have the best and most extensive consultation and information sharing that we've ever had in the in the land registry and, and we're able to influence not only our proposed changes are taken forward but also in many cases whether it should even happen at all so what this has highlighted is the importance of leading the group negotiators being reps who understand the day job and are present in the workplace and this has enabled us to make the right technical and practical arguments to support representations so moving on from that in 2016 following the agreement being signed we wrote to the director of hr outlining our concerns around mental health in the workplace in the letter, we highlighted the number of working days lost over the previous year to mental health, anxiety and stress, which actually amounted to the whole of the land registry losing more whole day to those reasons. So the first practical change that we saw was the introduction of mental health first aiders in every workplace. Whilst acknowledging that they're not universally welcomed in other areas of the civil service, they've been a valuable resource for our members in the HMLR and generally seen as a positive thing. This was followed by a commitment from land registry that we took up to properly discuss mental health in the workplace and also equipment to improve the overall working culture in the work organization. Everything we just discussed now includes the impacts on people's mental health. Rather than always looking to introduce reasonable adjustments for individuals, we look at policy and try to find areas that can be improved upon, making sure policy does not have a negative effect on everyone's mental health. Same applies for neurodiversity. PCS runs an excellent neurodiversity in the workplace course. And following attendance of one of these, we entered into discussions with HR and worked jointly on a neurodiversity toolkit, which has been very well received and has been supported by blogs and line manager training sessions. What we actually learned as reps by attending this uh, course was the focus on the social model of disability, which was referred to earlier. We've been able to use this in ongoing discussions with HR. It's really that working together that has enabled us to move on. The joint culture work we're involved in is moving in the workplace to a better place. And again, this is allowed to massively join the current COVID crisis. Those discussions with HR colleagues have led to changes in HR policy, particularly sickness absence policy, which now refers to mental health. We also agreed a mental health faction plan, which contains training for line managers, awareness training for all staff and professional training for mental health first aiders. And last year, we jointly worked on a stress risk ass assessment for the organisation as a whole, highlighting in areas that could potentially cause stress to colleagues has been really useful and that it used the traditional red, amber, green method of assessing risk and amber and red findings were highlighted to the relevant areas for action points and further discussion departmentally. We have a yearly health and wellbeing calendar that contains monthly events around mental health. And yes, that does include the odd coffee and cake morning, but more importantly, commits the organization to publish regular blogs around mental health that are written by directors and staff alike sharing their experiences. It's like a number of organisations, we've, we've taken part in the Mind Action Plan and we've had a specific mental health survey for all staff. Meet twice a month with the lead HR policy directors and they have produce a policy action plan. Outside those meetings, we also meet to discuss each separate policy, so things are vastly improved. Mm. Our members are now able to discuss their mental health with the line managers as a part of their everyday week, but things have still got a long way to go and we still have cases to deal yeah. with, but they're dealt with very differently. Of course. Um... 
Thank you, Adam. That's really useful. I mean, you've said a lot of things there in terms of, um, you know, actions that, that unions can, can take. I think the big takeaway is um, that things don't happen overnight. Um, so, you know, it's very much uh, thinking about from a risk assessment point of view, from a, from a collective point of view, from a, uh, even the, you were talking about um, ensuring these, this is even written into the policies and that they're acknowledged as, as something that should be addressed or really important actions we should take. Um, I also would like to clarify that I'm definitely not against coffee and cake. That is <laughs> some of the two things that are like getting me through lockdown. So, um, but as you rightly point out, it's about what, what else and yes, what else? Um, we've got uh, literally about 10 minutes so we've got a couple of questions I've just wanted to flag a few things um, in the chat because there's there's a lot of people on this call which is really great to see it just shows um, how much people have been thinking about this and, and all the um, action that unions want to take um, there's been quite a lot of talk about health and uh, mental health um, first aiders uh, which you spoke to as well Adam it sounds like and some of the workplaces have found that really successful um, we've just posted a link to a TUC um, blog on mental health first aid and does it work um, so we've got a few questions about that um, but I would um, encourage um, participants to take a look at that blog because we kind of do a bit more of a critical assessment um, uh, around that and the, and the union view on it as well um, so this again this uh, very very short in time and I do have to do a little bit of a roundup about Organise 2020 um, at the end so I'm going to go with two questions um, and I don't I'm not sure if every single panellist uh, is able to or want to um, speak to it so that's absolutely fine um, the first one is um, around I guess the sort of return to work from coronavirus and thinking about how we want to be not doing things as they used to be done um, so they're thinking about building back better, that kind of buzzword. But how, how would that be incorporated into um, the workplace? So we're thinking health and safety um, risk assessments. You know, we, we're going really big at the TUC on making sure that every single employer um, has got a robust risk assessment about how they're making workplace the workplace safe for uh, for their workers and return to work. How do we talk about um, sort of mental health in, in, in that context? And what is the kind of, if you could give one action um, that you'd like to see included um, in that conversation with employers, what, what do you think it should be? Can I go to Adam first on that, just because we've uh, just heard from you and then anyone else who wants to, to come in? Yeah, of course. So regarding risk assessments, we've been involved with helping write the risk assessment for the whole organisation, but each local office has also had the site specific plan as well to, to deal with that office. Um, individual risk assessments are being done for each person that's returning back to work. So there are a series of questions to ask for line managers to ask, ask um, workers. We've seen those questions, we've agreed those questions. Okay. And also there's a, there are different groups of people that have been identified that may wish to return to work first. And the first group is people who have identified them as either being vulnerable at home due to the home circumstances or people who are suffering with mental health at home. And if they really wanted to return to work, we, we may look into that as, as them being the first to, to return safely. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Adam. Um, I'm also wondering if Kendall or Anne um, had any uh, thoughts on this. Um, if, if you don't want to answer it, that's absolutely fine. Um, but repeat the question yeah sorry it was quite a long-winded one that's no problem um we, there's been quite a lot of conversations from various people about the concerns of uh people's mental health and well-being uh as a return to work as part of the sort of post-covid return to work that idea of maybe not being feeling safe um about to returning to the workplace not having their reasonable adjustments met um you know losing the flexibility that some of us have have been benefiting from um, at this time and what panelists think uh, would be your sort of one thing you would encourage trade unions to look at to make sure that this was incorporated. Shall I go? Can, yes Anne please do. Um, well I'd like to say that for some people, I know this is going to be counter to what you want to hear, but for some people actually working from home has actually provided some benefits and for some disabled workers they have been, they have actually inadvertently, COVID's actually inadvertently proved to employers who have refused again and again and again uh, flexible adjustments such as home working as a reasonable adjustment 
as, as being not financially viable or not productive or whatever. The, it's, it, the, the COVID sudden sending us all, many of us who could work it from home, to work from home, um, has proven that many of the adjustments that the disabled workers have been asking for for years and the disabled people's movement are actually, can be magicked up at the flash of a hat if there's a national pandemic. And we want to make sure that the good points that have come through this are not lost when we return. We don't want to go back to the same old, same old. We want to take the lessons of increased accessibility back with us into the workplace. Um, there are going to be issues where we're going to be, some of us are going to be, it's going to be blended working and that's going to raise pluses and minuses. But there, and also one of the good things about coming back is for many um, people with, um, for many of us, social isolation is a key driver of mental distress. So there is going to be an advantage for those of us, as long as our employer implements all the things that Adam's mentioned, health and safety, health and safety, health and safety all the way, and understands that all workers are going to have a, a heightened risk to mental distress mm -hmm. during this phase, then I think we can move forward and the trade union movement has a big role in that. I think Sonia's got her Absolutely. hand. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, has she? Okay, I was actually going to uh, bring in Sonia and Kendall on the second question that we've received. Um, it's Sonia looks like she wants to say something. Okay, go on risk assessments in at work and something that they miss that they that they fail to do is look into the um the risk that your relatives or people that you're living with are in and this is something that's come up quite a lot but it happened in, in my own family in that um you know a member of my family was being forced to go into work despite the fact that her dad has had an organ transplant so he's really high risk and it caused immense stress for her that she could be bringing coronavirus home to him and um, because he was high risk, but yet she did the risk assessment and she was not, she was seen as low risk because she didn't have any health problems. So I think risk assessments need to, particularly in COVID, need to be taken into account who you are living with and family members as well. And people shouldn't be forced to go into the workplace and put the members of family at risk. Absolutely. Thank you, Sonia. And I think as, as well, you know, the idea of um, how you access work, how you get to work as well, and, and that to be considered. And thank you, Anne, as well, for making the very important point about the diff the uh, different experiences that people would have had whilst sort of in lockdown and the kind of um, negative and positive sides, you know, for, for, for everyone and that making sure that that's accounted for. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. I'm really sorry we ran out of time. Uh, basically, it's uh, such a huge conversation. It was technical difficulties in the first few minutes. Um, but this is for, for Kendall um, and anyone else. If we've got time, you can come in. And this is a question around... Um, the normalization, I guess, of, of exploitation at work, particularly for, for young people and the, the uh, way that uh, young people or, or those that are so used to being treated poorly just to kind of expect it um, and how, um, how that manifests in terms of um, people's mental well-being and, and their stress. So the question is, how do we change these low expectations and this mindset um, at work? Yeah, so um, uh, it's a very good question how we do it. I think it's um, one of those things. I think if you have the confidence to do it, it's kind of questioning it. Um, and lots of times I find like just questioning and asking like, is this normal? Is that okay? Um, why is that funny? Lots of kind of just basic questions or even just looking at them funny when they say something you're a bit like, oh, I'm not sure on that. Um, uh, as part of the question I think about kind of improving confidence to do that um, and I think a massive part of that is being in a trade union and knowing that actually you have that support um, I know I've worked with lots of colleagues um, lots of young people who have no idea what trade unions are and educating them and being able to be like actually this is a really great place for change and a really active you know place for support if you need it really help come together so if you have a couple of people at work who are um, you know, 
who's just you know that exploitation is so normalized for you all and you're that you you can see it and you're like oh hang on um you know maybe just suggest you know you go along to a branch meeting or what's you know see what the union can do you know we have um i know in unison we hold um building workshops and how to you know kind of question your employer in a productive way um and i'm sure lots of other unions have similar things so i think it's kind of just looking together and seeing how you can work together and that is you know a massive part of the trade union movement actually like looking at your colleagues and thinking actually this is an issue and how can we change it together with the union fantastic thanks kendall um does anyone want to add like 30 seconds thoughts on the question okay. around sort of um making people uh sort of more alert i guess to the way that they're being treated in in the workplace or is it organised, which is obviously the answer, which you all knew was the answer before you even joined this <laughs> webinar. Yeah. Yeah, Sonia, Sonia, yes, please. You can see the NHS, because there's lots of different professions and different occupations in the NHS. And the ones that have, um, that are more unionised and more active unions, you see have better working conditions and better rights. So I think the key to that is unions um, and getting, as you said, young people involved um, in union unions. Because I think a lot of young people, I, I see this a lot, like, don't actually get involved in union until they hit a problem um, and actually getting people involved in union from the start and knowing their rights is really important so getting them like at school age and um, so people understand what workers rights actually means and, and the importance of collective action fantastic thank you so much um right so that takes us to just about the weekend so uh the last two things from me well three things first of all thank you so much for um our speakers uh sonia Kendall, Anne and Adam, who've joined us today, and uh, my tech support, Shelley, in the background. Uh, she has actually been posting links in the chats throughout to a lot of resources um, that the TUC and our member unions have produced um, on the different topics that we've talked about uh, today. So if you've got a chance, kind of, if you can sc scroll up and uh, take a look at that, that will be great. Um, Kendall talked about the TUC Young Workers Forum um, briefing uh, from resilience to resistance, organising and campaigning for better mental health um, and well-being. Um, and in that briefing, because we thought about this ahead of time, at the end of that, it has further links and resources. So it talks about um, what can reps do. It, it thinks about um, how to do, uh, you know, stress um, risk assessments. It, it talks about using the um, social model for disability. Um, it talks about the different campaigns that the TUC um, are running at the moment, such as petitions that you can sign. They're sort of linked, you know, sick pay for all, ten pound an hour minimum wage. Um, ending sexual harassment um, at work and it also talks um, a little bit about or it links to some of the research that the TUC has done um, in the area of mental health and well-being, public services, young workers um, and disabled workers too. And the last thing I must say because we are at, at four o'clock at five o'clock is for everyone to make sure that you take the organised 2020 pledge um, that is we're wanting as many people as possible to um, pledge that they're going to uh, take forward organising um, in the workplace um, along with the, with their colleagues and their comrades. And you can find that, um, if you can't find it in the chat, you can Google Organise 2020 uh, and it will come up on the main um, web page. Um, so really encourage people um, as a sort of first thing that they can do off the back of this chat is to, to do that and to, to sign the pledge. Um, so thank you again for everyone that participated for, for our speakers and our support um and make sure we'll uh, get lots and lots and lots of follow-up information and actions to you on this incredibly important topic okay take care have a great weekend